Let me start the recording. Um, hello, I would like to welcome you all officially here uh, to this open webinar with Mark Wade. Uh, I'm very excited that we can have him again and the leap advance um, for, for a webinar for, with us today. Um, for those of you that don't know Mark, um, Mark has been an advisor for a very long time for Oikos. And now with the restructuring, he still um, agreed to join the advisory council. And um, we're very happy to have him with us on board. He's always there for us with a lot of advices and friendly words and encouraging words for us. And um, he's also a known expert for sustainability topics. And today he will talk about uh, the competences of a responsible leader and what do we need to, in today's world? What leaders do we need? to solve uh, the problems that we're actually facing. Um, before, he, before he's um, starting, um, I would like to, since we have some people here that have never been to a webinar, I guess, um, I would like to introduce you a little bit to the LEAP program as such. Um, you might know that one part of the LEAP program, my screen, so you can see it. Can you see it? Um, so the, the LEAP program, which this webinar is a part of, um, is the Oikos Leadership Program and it's designed to, uh, to educate sustain responsible leaders among the chapters. So the chapters are more empowered and um, can have more influence and more impact in the world. And uh, the participants of the LEAP program will, are equipped with insights and knowledge on sustainable leadership and responsible leadership, and also uh, tools to embed more sustainability in their decisions and actions and to develop themselves further. Um, so how does it look like? We have uh, two on-site meetings each year. One is in October before the Future Lab, and the other one is always before the spring meeting in March. And uh, there we do some on-site activities to get to know each other, to form the groups and uh, also to, to have some deep developments. And it's kind of the start to, for, your, for your ongoing development journey then. Uh, it's a nine month journey um, in total, the Leap Advance. And um, during the, so we have the on-site meeting at the beginning and then in the middle. We have webinars with experts such as Mark is one, um, where they give you insights and more knowledge so you can discuss that with your, with your peer groups. Then you have peer group meetings. Uh, a peer group is a group of other, with other participants, like four to five people with one coach. And, um, and in this group, you can discuss whatever is important to you, but you, we, you can reflect on topics of the webinars, you can reflect on your developments and so on. It's basically, it's a possibility for you to share your concerns or your progresses during your development journey in the LEAP. And then there are free reflections. Um, a reflection is a guide that gives you some, some input or some possibilities to, to develop yourself. Further, um, for example, it can be an exercise that you have to try out, and then you just write about it, or it can be um, a challenge. Um, it can be just also just something to think about. Um, it it's always varies on. Um, we have different exercises in every guide, and then uh, we have coaching individual coaching sessions um, with. So you have one uh, for forty five minutes. Um, each month with an individual coach where this coach just focuses on your development and what you need to develop yourself further towards being a responsible leader. And, um, and then we have experiential learning where we encourage you to actually try out the exercises that we did in, on on-site meetings or even um, in the webinars and uh, try this out with a group with your chapter, for example, or friends, your family, whoever you would like to do, or your peer group, some did it with, with their peer groups. Um, so you can try also 
out how, how it is to facilitate something and to be a coach yourself. Um, because um, after having this, after having done this nine month journey, there is the possibility to become a coach in the next cohort then for the leap, um, for the leapers in the year after for their peer to peer groups. So that's it. Um, that's the different pillars of the leap. Um, it's an amazing program um, with a, a really in, inspiring and interesting people. And um, it always gives you the possibility to develop yourself, no matter how often you do it. <laughs> I can tell you that. I've been there from the beginning on. And um, yeah, um, I would really like to encourage you to, to join this, um, this great opportunity since it's for free and it um, gives you so much back. <laughs> Um, I will tell you a little bit more about some dates that are up, coming up because we have an introduction call coming up um, in, in June, at the end of June, um, at the end of the webinar. But now I would like to hand over to Mar Mark to start. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, and thanks for joining and showing an interest in learning a little bit more about responsible leadership and what it takes to become a responsible leadership, particularly in a world which is desperately in need of that leadership if we're going to have a sustainable world. Um, now, before I go on, I know you're all embarrassingly good at speaking English, but do pull me up if I speak too quickly and I'm not being clear or I'm using words which are unfamiliar. So. Um, uh, just go like that or something or shout at me by unmuting uh, because I want uh, uh, to engage with you, not to talk at you. Um, and um, in, in fact, um, uh, can I move these myself, um, uh, Alexandra? Slides? I, I yes. don't think so. No. Okay. Well, that's great. Uh, so we're on the first slide. Thank you. So um, this evening as sort of oikis, I know that you're already responsible leaders and you're already showing leadership by being active in your chapters or in Oikos International. But today is an opportunity to delve a little deeper into what it takes to become a responsible leader when leading activities either in Oikos or, or wherever your careers may take you in the future. And we'll start by sharing some qualities of leaders um, who have inspired you. And we'll make this uh, into an interactive session. We'll see how that works because we've never done it on a webinar before, although I know it works very well when we're all together in the same room. And then we'll take a look at what we mean by leadership and how this has changed over time. And we'll look briefly at why the world needs leaders of a different caliber than is common at the moment, leaders of what I would call a different norm and the competences and behaviors that that might entail. And finally, if we have time, and uh, I'd like to touch on leadership in high performing teams and the importance of individual and collective responsibility. And I know some of you have heard me bang on about this before, um, but I do understand if you have to leave or if in fact people like Benoit and Tiffane may have heard um, a little story I'm going to tell, um, then I fully understand that um, you, you can drop off. And, um, uh, and I'll also say that all the slides that I'm going to share today will also be made available to yourselves as a resource afterwards, um, if you would find that helpful. And I know Alexandra uh, will make that possible. So uh, next slide, please, Alexandra. There we are. Now, I hope in the sort of the pre-note that you've already been thinking about leaders that might have inspired you. And I had suggested that you might like to think of people either from history or current times, uh, public figures or indeed from your private life, maybe your grandma or somebody or somebody in your his family history that have really inspired you and to think about what values, behaviours and qualities did they embody that made them so inspiring to you. So can I invite you um, to spend um, a few moments, normally we do this in a buzz group, but um, if you're all in individuals, well then just do it as individuals um, and then in four or five minutes time or so I'm going to uh, invite those who want to share to share some of their feelings about what were the values and behaviors and qualities of those leaders that inspired you. So can I leave that with you now for three or four minutes and then we'll get back together again.
maybe just another minute and then we'll see who would like to share. Okay then, um, who'd like to be brave enough to leap in here? No pun intended. <laughs> Not all at the same time, guys. <laughs> yeah, Benoit, yeah. Okay. Um, well, the leader that inspired me is Elon Musk, um, mm -hmm. because like he really believed in, uh, what is being possible to do so in himself, but also in the goods, um, in federating a team towards a higher purpose, which by the way is for the common goods. So for example, he wanted to launch Tesla. And the aim of Tesla is to advance um, um, sustainable mobility. Mm -hmm. And so it's not uh, something about himself. It's something about like, the society as a whole to move forward. Um, and the quality is that he managed to gather a team uh, around himself at the beginning. Uh, so he managed to attract brains and inspire people to act, to empower them, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know about values because I know uh, his management style is not the best. <laughs> uh, yeah. But he made quite impressive things, and I think he understood a lot about how do you gather a team together to build something which individually you cannot do, but collectively you might maybe don't do something different. Wonderful, Benoit. Thank you. Um, others might have a leader in mind and. What inspired them about them? Yeah, I also have one. And the first person who came to my mind was Short Ziegler. Because I think he is um, like his integrity really impressed me, and also that he has such a strong feeling for responsibility for the poorest and also kind of his social stewardship and although I like as far as I remember I think he was in prison also for his actions and still continued afterwards with for example criticizing the biggest companies for their actions and I think that's actually a really really strong kind of <clears throat> passion for something and that He's also very good in helping, holding speeches and to empower others. And that is impressive for me and also our qualities for good leaders. Mm -hmm. Magdalena, thank you. That's great. Other thoughts? Additional qualities or behaviors or values that you've seen to the ones we've already had? Someone who came to my mind was um, Jane Goodall because she realized that in order to save nature, you actually have to give the humans around the, the right setting to actually help nature. That first, you have to abolish inequalities in the society before the society can actually appreciate nature and all the resources we're using from nature. And that's how she um, started all these 
apes and monkey projects in, in Africa where she wanted to conserve nature but couldn't do it because um, of the human, of the societal inequalities. And therefore, she, and I think, yeah, she's doing a great job with that. Lovely, thank you. Well, so far we've had things like having um, self-belief and self-confidence, being able to put teams together, operating at a higher purpose with integrity. Um, they're brave, passionate, articulate. They have a strong sense of nature. They stand for equality. Um, and they get great teams together through inspiring people and empowering teams to do things um, and to uh, think uh, and to do the extraordinary. So already we've got a tremendous list of qualities, um, if you like, and behaviors um, that, that correspond to um, inspiring leadership. Um, and uh, a lot of these are very contemporary, um, which are very much aimed at solving some of the world's great problems like sustainable mobility and, um, and nature and tackling some of the inequalities in the world, uh, which are so ra rampant at the moment. Um, any other thoughts or things that you believe are really integral to responsible leadership um, uh, that you have seen and experienced? I have to say, for me, a responsible leader is also someone who really knows what they're talking about. So they have the background, they have the, uh, the knowledge for it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really important as well. Lovely. Thank you. Yes. So they're going to have some mastery of their, of their discipline, of their activity that they can bring to the team. Yeah, that's great. Show some leadership through, through that knowledge. And just to add to the um, knowledge part, I would also say they need credibility in that they live the lifestyle that they preach, mm. um, especially for responsible leaders. I think that's great. And uh, those of you who have had anything to do with um, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, well, they're their mantra of walking the talk. So that speaks exactly to your point that um, uh, otherwise leaders aren't credible, which is a great word you used. Um, uh, they have to be credible. They have to be authentic, which goes with this. Yeah, so excellent. Any other thoughts? Just a couple more, and then we'll we'll uh, we'll summarise some of this. I've never known Oikis to be shy before. <laughs> so yeah, um, for me, it's definitely like trust and respect, which is important, and also kind of. A, a means of humbleness, um, mm -hmm. but also um, a responsible leader or a sustainable leader must show up in his whole, like, whole variety of human being, let's say. Uh, like, he, like, for me, it's important. Like, I think a good sense of humor is just as much a part of being a leader as. Um, <laughs> having an objective view on things and having a good overview on what is happening um, and kind of inviting people to also being open and show, show up uh, in a more wholesome way in the workplace. Wonderful, thank you. Can I hear crickets in the background there? You must be somewhere very warm. Yes, yes. <laughs> 35 degrees here. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I'm very jealous. <laughs> I think Clementine is particularly jealous at the moment because she's shivering in uh, St. Gallen, I think. <laughs> well, look, um, thank you very much for that. I think you've come up with a fantastic list. Um, you've talked about belief, having self-belief and self-confidence. You've had, you've talked about um, uh, uh, being, having the ability of, uh, of forming teams and empowering them and uh, inspiring them through encouraging them to think to a higher purpose. 
We talked about them having integrity, uh, they're being brave, passionate, articulate, having a strong sense of nature, a strong sense of when um, inequalities are there and in low intolerance of that and the desire to do something about it. Um, and coming with credibility and authenticity, bringing expertise and, uh, and um, but also at the same time, engendering a sense of respect through humbleness and, uh, and trust, um, bringing a sense of humor, uh, to, because often situations can be difficult and complex, um, but to invite a sense of openness uh, for people to all contribute in a full way, um, to get the very best out of people. Um, and I think that that's you know, a really terrific list of some of the values or the behaviors and qualities in fact, some people even prepared to go to prison to stand up for what they believe for and then to come back and still have the courage to go on and, and um, uh, spread the word for the things that they believe are important. So I think that's a fantastic and very inspiring list. And maybe we can hold that um, in, in mind as, as we go through. And you can use that list. And um, I'm, I'm sure we've got that caught somewhere. I've certainly written most of that down. Um, and, and we can post that and, and use it as, um, uh, as an inspiration inspiration. Um, so now then, let's um, sort of um, move on from that and uh, perhaps get a little bit more structured. So if I could have the next slide, please, um, Alexandra. What I'd like to do now is to take a, a sort of a brief look at some of the words we're using, perhaps even without thinking about it. And the first word is sort of responsibility or to being, being responsible. And, and I love this, it comes from the Latin, of course, and it's the ability to respond, to be able to answer for one's conduct and obligations, and to tell right from wrong. And both of those are really powerful notions. And if we bear those in mind when we take leadership positions, then already we're in the, we've got the right mindset. Um, and it's very interesting to see how um, Contempt, how the definition of responsible leadership has sort of evolved with time. Could I have the next slide, please? Now, if we go back to the uh, beginning of the last century, um, at the sort of mid-industrial period, um, here's a definition by Taylor that said, the principal object of management is secure the maximum prosperity for the owners and employees of an activity. And maximum prosperity prosperity can only exist through maximum productivity. So it, it's, it's interesting that um, then it was uh, uh, responsibility was about delivering prosperity, but just for those that were involved in the enterprise through productivity and, and an industrial period that that was um, uh, probably uh, 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 acceptable at that time. Next slide, please. Now, by the mid-60s, uh, the famous economist um, Friedman, of course, made the now infamous statement, uh, and that was that um, responsibility, it's all about making shareholders as much money as possible, and perhaps even worse still in our eyes, that any notion of social responsibility would undermine free society. And how outdated that sounds now, but that was common in the 60s when it was all grab, grab, grab. And now if we have the next slide. Well, I'm very pleased to say that, of course, a more enlightened view of what responsible leadership has emerged and where business leaders are seen that they can serve as planetary citizens and be key actors in providing solutions to global needs. And this is a view that's very much perpetuated by CEOs of member companies of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, an organization that have actually had a lot to do with. And I find this a far more relevant and inspiring definition of responsible leadership um, than um, as some of the forerunners of that. Um, and if we could have the next slide, please. And I think um, there's one um, uh, UNDP slide that the WBCSD used in their envisioning exercise for 2050 that sums up the context for responsible leadership better than any. And it's quite an old slide now, but to me, it's still the slide. And I think uh, uh, um, puts together the whole challenge. And here we have the UNDP index of human development on the horizontal axis and the ecological footprint um, on the vertical axis and plotted on are the positions of developing and developed countries. 
And it's easy to see that the Western world has the highest level of development and the highest levels of unsustainable impact up in the top right there. And put simply, if all the world was operating as we do in the West, we would need between four to six Earth units. And of course, we've only got one. So if you just build the slide, please, Alexandra, we'll make that point. And one more uh, build, please. And so if we're really going to achieve, um, and one more build again, uh, the, the vision of 9 billion people living well within the limits of the planet, and then to tackle these complex challenges as never before, then we're going to need uh, leadership of a really different caliber than is normal. And in fact, the planet will probably need to accommodate over 10 billion, um, as we now know, by the middle of this century. And a planet that's increasingly challenged by global warming and the climatic and social instability um, that this is creating. And I don't need to tell you any more about this. You already know it. So if we could have the next slide, please. So what we've got then, if we're going to all get to live well within that our one planet, is that we have to challenge uh, uh, address rather complex challenges, massively complex challenges. And for any business or for any organization, that means translating sustainability into the core strategy of that organization, whether it's Oikos, whether it's uh, World Wildlife Fund or whether it's DuPont, it doesn't matter. It, it, that, that's what we've got to do. And we've got to do it in a way which um, is sincere and authentic. Um, and the other part of this is to develop leaders as whole people, very much in the way that you've been talking about earlier, and to change the culture of organizations so that they can understand the responsibility of organizations to addressing some of these uh, global challenges and driving results in these large complex organizations in a way which grows organization as well as social value. It's not a trade-off, it's if, if you do it right, if you can do both of these things to, um, uh, together. And so if we can have the next slide, please. So this is going to be requiring responsible leadership, which is way beyond the norm that we normally see in business or even in NGOs, to be honest. Um, it can be very narrow focused. It can be very uh, self-centered and self-interested. But we're going to need leaders that are sensitive and responsive to global and local realities. That leaders that are comfortable in diverse cultures, um, that are able to build relationships with multiple stakeholders, as you've already been saying, and to use the insights gained to inspire and innovate and redefine that strategy, maybe to move it to a better place. And of course, to be able to manage complexity at all levels, both within the organization, but also the wider externalities. And leaders who can break down the silos that we often find in organizations to join them up and align the organization for a sense of collective purpose and new ways of working. And of course, who can then drive lasting change to a new culture that can actually um, uh, deliver on this. If we could have the next slide, please. So what might be some of the qualities that are going to be needed to address this very tall order that we're going to be asking of leaders? Um, and it is a tall order. And some of these you've already come up with, and it's very interesting. We'll look at this uh, a little bit more closely in a moment. But the sort of the, certainly when I was uh, being trained, that the, the, the items on the left-hand box, the yesterday, what, what was expected of leaders, was that they would be technically smart and they, they would be intelligent and they would be process champions to get the most efficiency out of things and they would drive execution sometimes at consequences to people and they would be performance managers um, and they'd be critical thinkers analytical thinkers and they'd be personally high performers probably very competitive and they were out there they understood the importance of satisfying customers um, and of being locally um, uh, effective but that's not enough. Now, it's not to say that the stuff on the left isn't still important, but we need a lot more. So today we need yesterday plus, and we need people who um, are technically savvy and intelligent, of course, particularly in today's technological world, but now being people smart, 
and showing emotional intelligence and that self-awareness that you were talking about earlier, um, not just for themselves, but also of those around themselves. Um, and that's just as vital. And as we go down the table, you can read for yourselves, um, you'll see how it's a much more, uh, it's a list more of, of human characteristics. Um, you, you used the word humble before, collaborative, inclusive, leadership that is required. Leaders who do not pretend to know all the answers because it's impossible to, for one person to know all the answers. And that's, if that humility is there, then um, you, can, uh, you can recognize that, be self-aware, and then to start the right, to create the right climate that you were talking about, to empower people within teams, to bring their ideas and their solutions, so that the leader becomes a facilitator under which the right results actually operate, uh, actually emerge. And obviously it's leaders who are comfortable operating right across cultures and who are globally effective. So cross-culturally cross sensitive and aware. And I certainly noticed that, that um, the, it's okay, um, that these um, are many of the, the, the qualities and the behaviors that you've already identified. So I think you're spot on for bringing out these human characteristics which go beyond the sort of process champion and independent competitive leader of the past. And let me just use, um, look at some of the words that I, I used there. Now, prudent, meaning sound judgment and a great understanding of people. I think it's a great word. And then, um, and to be able to see ahead, to foresee and to provide for. One of these wonderful words um, that we'd like to see embodied in leadership. And the next slide, please. is systems thinking, being able to see structures, patterns and cycles in complex systems to identify issues and develop optimal systems wide solutions. Um, and I think if we can do that, then we're stepping away from the silos, we're stepping away and we can have joined up thinking, which is going to provide more of a chance of, of getting on top of some of these complex problems that we have. And um, um, next slide, here's just an example. Don't bother with the detail, just look at the numbers on the slide. This came out of an energy efficiency in buildings program that I was helping to facilitate with the WBCSD. And it's talking, and here it just shows in one design team, just look at all the different topics, disciplines, expertise, stakeholders that are involved in just a design team for energy use in new buildings. It's, it's extraordinary. And if we go to the next slide, um, you can see why integrated design and getting on top of these complex needs is so hard. Um, and that's a recognition. Again, don't bother looking at the detail. You can just see the complexity on the side. Um, but the next slide um, shows that if we invest time early on in the left-hand corner there, um, in that preliminary design and in building the performance of our teams before we go too far down the line, doing all the things you've been talking about, about empowerment and, and getting the best out of people and, and uh, imparting passion and new vision, then that is time very well spent by leaders because too often it's a step that's missed at the beginning of new activities. And then of course you find out all sorts of problems later or you have dysfunctional teams and that leads to untold cost and disruption. So even though it looks like uh, delaying the process, it, believe me, it's, it's a lesson for all of us in how to take time out at the beginning of things to get that team right, um, to get the vision right, to get the culture right, and to start thinking about all of the different parameters that you, we need to engage with and all the different stakeholders we need to engage with um, to get their views and their expectations and hopes and fears before we start rather than finding these things out later when it's too late or very costly to go back and to re-engineer these things. Um, so um, next slide, please. And you've already mentioned humble. And I think it's wonderful you picked that out because I picked that out as being probably the number one quality that I would hope to see in a leader. And that means unpretentious, not having or showing any feelings of superiority, not arrogant or assertive. And so there's a build on this slide there, please. But that humble does not mean 
whoops, uh, lacking in self-confidence. It absolutely doesn't mean that because the next slide, please, Self, being self-confident, and you've already said this uh, early on when we had the interactive sessions, that having or showing great faith in oneself or one's abilities, cool-headed, composed, unperturbed, disciplined, optimistic. And I believe only a self-confident person can win the trust of people and serve as an effective leader. So humble and self-confident um, are not counterpoints, they're actually both um, uh, important um, aggregate uh, uh, capabilities. So if we have the next slide, please. So, so far we've been looking at the qualities or attributes of responsible leaders, but what about the specific competencies, the range of skills and abilities that leaders need to possess and to develop? Now, we probably don't have time um, uh, to go through all of these in details. But when I was um, in a previous role of head of sustainability learning, I took a set of our internal competencies and leadership skills, which have been developed by the HR partners, uh, um, uh, sorry, the department, um, that people were expected to possess, like build shared vision and various other things you'll see in a moment. And then I upgraded this set to include the value skills and mindsets consistent with what we've just been talking about. So I took a conventional set of HR competencies and built in the things and added to it, supplemented what I felt were consistent with the sorts of things you've been talking about. And for the most part, those are the things which are shown in blue. So I'm not going to go through all of this in detail, but just to pick out some of the things uh, that are in blue, which I think are additive to perhaps the normal or yesterday's view um, of leadership. And this set of competencies, um, as far as I know, is still in use within the organization that I was with before. And so that's pertained for at least 10 years now. Um, and um, uh, that's uh, um, quite encouraging that these notions have stayed within the organization. So for build shared vision, and you've already mentioned that, um, it's, it's not enough to just engage and inspire and align the organization um, and to let local strategies, but to engage wider stakeholders outside of the organization. So you get that wider context of the, um, the, the, that you're actually building your shared vision within. And to motivate and coach all people, not just the internal ones, but the people that would be impacted or would have a stake in your activity, which are actually external to the organization. Next slide, please. And um, once you've done that, it's to use that, um, uh, 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 to use those learnings. Sorry, I'm, I'm skipping ahead. Um, so, yes, on customer focus here now, again, it's okay to have a deep understanding of the customer, but what about the wider stakeholder needs which might be um, involved um, in the impact of those uh, products or services or the way they're made or their end use. So we need to know these things as well if we're going to build these into system solutions that go beyond the norm. And again, to engage those external stakeholders constructively and build new strategic relationships. Um, and I think that's um, uh, very uh, important to um, bring that external perspective into what you're doing because you can then identify external trends and stakeholder needs and you can satisfy multiple expectations and therefore you're going to be far more valued as an organization and probably more successful and profitable if you do these things. Um, so it's the keys to gaining those ex um, um, uh, uh, external trends and societal expectations and then driving those into uh, perhaps into a new strategic direction. And then an example of this may be understanding the need to replace fossil fuels with renewable energy and thus building completely new partners and supply chain relationships. And if you don't have those, that, that knowledge of the way that the world is changing and of how to build new stakeholder strategic relationships and new strategic partners, then you won't be able to evolve um, in a way. You won't see the need to evolve and you won't have the capacity to evolve. So the next slide, please. And then this one is um, around professional mastery. Well, don't just look 
internally for your expertise, look externally for that. Go and talk to people, usually from different walks of life, different um, uh, areas of expertise, because the great insights that have come have usually come from outside disciplines, coming into another one, from medical research into engineering or vice versa. It, it's going outside to find professional mastery and be inspired by things outside of your discipline that gives you um, um, a greater context. Um, and then you'll see patterns emerging as well. And you'll be able to develop external expertise and experiences which will enrich you as a leader and bring in things which otherwise would never appear in your thinking. And it's very important as well to, um, uh, to uh, get away from sort of short-termism and all the errors and some optimal um, results that this brings. So we can have the next slide, please. And you've probably noticed by now that there's a pattern emerging here that seeking out the value and, and valuing, sorry, and valuing the views of others, constantly looking beyond the organization and seeing things in a broader context and using diverse inputs is, is a new and uh, essential trend. And recognizing, as I said, the importance of intangibles like reputation and taking a long term view of the impacts of decisions and get away from this awful short termism that we see is so prevalent in the markets and all the areas, errors and suboptimal results that this creates. So here you can see these things highlighted again. And um, if you uh, move to the next slide as well, please and displaying personal effectiveness. Um, you'll see this very clearly in this slide that you need to gain trust and confidence externally as much as internally if you're going to be credible and be authentic and your company or organization to be seen to be authentic and walking the talk. So seeking out the views and values of others and engaging with people and identifying those short-term and long-term risk and opportunities before making decisions is so critical. And then having open and honest long-term relationships with a wide range of influential internal and external partners. So uh, next slide, please. And valuing differences, well, that pretty well speaks for itself, but it's important that we go beyond in, in doing this and expressing this as the individual and creating a culture within the organization that we're leading that values diversity and inclusiveness. Um, so uh, uh, that's what the sort of additional thing we brought in. The next slide, please. And probably um, this is one that I, I developed, which pretty well sums it all up. And I coined it as sustainability or external mindset. And um, this was a slide that we used in internal assessment centers for identifying developmental needs of um, professionals who are, were looking for advancement and using them as a selection criteria for promotion to senior executive levels within the organization. And this was built in uh, how we evaluated these, um, uh, the, the, these competencies um, in internal assessment uh, role plays and, and various other things. So seeing that bigger picture was absolutely critical. Identifying the key players and the trends of influences, economic, environmental, and social. That ability to engage and build relationships, to seek out and value the views of others internally and externally before you make decisions early on in processes to reduce risk and to identify opportunities and to, again, to use that learning to master complexity to address the local and the short-term priorities and the considerations for the longer-term needs and relationships and then of course to innovate and use those insights for inno to innovate to optimize that strategic value growth of the organization. Now I know I've repeated this a bit but I don't think it hurts to repeat some of these things and if you just go to the next slide we're nearly finished now. Here is a list if you like of uh, behaviors which exemplify high competence in, in, uh, in this regard. And you can read yourself uh, those and they'll be in the slide set that I'll send you. And then the converse of that is low competence on the next slide. And people who are largely 
unaware or uninterested in the wider operating environment, who have a short or narrow horizon, who are confused by complexity, who seek solutions within their comfort zone and have a low inclinational capacity to engage with outside parties and build few, if any, new long-term relationships. And these people really need help. Um, and sometimes you find uh, uh, people with these levels of attributes within the team. And that's where coaching and mentoring by the leader becomes so important to, uh, because we have a real development need here. And I don't doubt at all that in the teams you lead and will lead in the future, that, that you will find people in your teams who are there. And that doesn't mean to say you still can't get the best out of them and create the right culture to empower them to develop and to grow. In many cases, people who have these sorts of levels of competence have been browbeaten by bad leaders and bad managers, and they're scared to do some of these things. There's some cultures are not even allowed to do some of these things. Um, so as you as leaders, you can um, break the mold and, in, uh, and help people break out and to grow. So, um, there, uh, so, I'm going to pause now because I've been talking for quite a long time and I want to give you a chance to sort of uh, come back to me and say, was anything unclear, uh, anything that you didn't agree with, anything you'd like to build on? And if we still have time and energy, um, then I'd be very like, I'd like to go on and um, give you a little bit of, um, without any slides, tell you a story about high performing teams and uh, uh, individual and collective responsibility, um, but I'm not going to do that unless you feel you'd like to go an extra 10 minutes or so. So I'm going to hand back to you now and um, uh, just um, get a bit of uh, feedback. Well, uh, I would like to thank you, Mark. Uh, it's always very inspiring to uh, hear you. And we know you have a great experience with leadership. So uh, it really helps us to have um, some, how should I put it? To, some, to have some candles uh, along our Argus way or other way to know how we could behave in a better way uh, through very easy steps. Um, so I would like to thank you for that. Thanks, Benoit. Did what I say resonate or did it feel uncomfortable? Um, if I may. Oh, Kai, you wanted to say something? No? Uh, no, thank you very much. It did uh, resonate at least uh, to me. Uh, and I wanted to ask uh, if it was possible for you to give us a, maybe a concrete example of uh, how you were talking about high competences and low competences at the very end. And you were saying that if um, we have or if we see people having those low competences and they would need to be or we would need to go and get coached to, to get those high competencies. So how uh, can we coach people to, 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 to gain those, those uh, competencies and how can we be coached to gain those competencies? <laughs> Very good question. Um, I think the first thing is to say that I believe passionately that everybody can improve. And I think it's giving them the opportunity and the encouragement to improve and to be honest about where they're struggling and to um, uh, provide um, that uh, support for those things that they feel that they need to develop. So that's the positive side. And I think the other thing is to acknowledge that not all people are equal and some people just are better at things than others. And it's the, the job is to find the things that they're really good at and passionate and get them to really grow to their best ability in the things that they are naturally good at. And, and so it's helping to identify those. And I think it's unfair to expect that we can all aspire to the highest levels of everything all the time because we can't. 
I'm terrible at languages. You could all teach me how to better speak German or French or Chinese or whatever. I, I'm, I'm the world's worst linguist. Um, but I am good at some other things. Um, and, and I think it's a good leader will help, will take the time to understand their people in their teams. Will, uh, particularly when you're setting up new teams, get to know them as people. What really drives their passion? Ask them what they're good at and what they're bad at, what they really like to do, what switches them on. And then, of course, then you can assign your people in teams to do the things that best fit them. And then you're already a long way to improving the overall quality of the team. And then there may be some things which people are interested in, but they simply don't have the skills yet. Um, they've never been taught how to, um, I don't know, build a web or something like that, a website. Now that's a skill and then you can uh, um, uh, provide the appropriate training or you can send them on a course or whatever. Right? So I think there's a difference between skills and, and some of these more intangible competencies and attributes we've been talking about. But you can still encourage people by saying, why don't you go and talk to somebody? Well, uh, it would be a really nice idea if you ask them for some advice or to get them to step out and to feel confident in being empowered to challenge and to step out. So uh, Clementine, it's a great question and I don't have a simple answer for it, but maybe those are some insights that could be helpful. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, Alexia, you wanted to say something? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, but I'm, um, yeah, but please do let me know if it's too noisy. Um, I wanted to know as well, what would be a good way to self-assess or can one even self-assess on all those intangible skills? Ooh, now that's a really interesting question. Um, I think you can to a degree if you're self-aware and you kind of know that perhaps you don't look outside for solutions or perhaps it's, you feel you like to operate in your own comfort zone or perhaps um, uh, you don't like dealing with complex new situations, you, you, you'd rather um, do something more of a routine nature. So I think the first key to, to, being, to knowing whether you can self-assess is to be self-aware. And if you can't be self-aware, um, then, or you feel uncomfortable or you, have, you don't feel you can do it properly, then that's where, go and ask a friend um, uh, and, uh, uh, and have a chat and say, how do you see me? What do you think my strengths and weaknesses are? Um, uh, where do you think I could improve? What do you think some of the things that um, uh, maybe I've made mistakes in the past? So if you've got the courage um, to ask these questions of yourself or somebody you trust, either within the team or maybe your team leader, or if you are the leader, ask the team. Uh, because I do believe that the best teams will self-assess individual members themselves in a natural way. And they will do it. You don't have to make it, you could make it a session once every six months or so, or on an end of year cycle review or something. But the best teams do it naturally by a culture that enables people to say, hey, Alexia, you did that really well. I, wow, I was knocked out by that. Or um, uh, Clementine, um, oh gosh, um, perhaps if you just asked me first, um, I'm, I'm making this up. Um, but you see what I mean? Uh, that good teams with the right culture and with a sense of trust and empowerment will constantly help people to self-assess um, as you go along. But it's important that in the process of doing that, it's done constructively and it's done with respect and it's done with humility. Um, and then you get the best out of it. Okay, do you, uh, would you like to uh, uh, have a Put your question or point? Yeah, no, I, I don't have any question. That's why I uh, let the others first. Um, I just wanted to, to thank you for the um, nice lecture. It was like really interesting and on point. And um, 
yeah, I, I wasn't able to follow all the way because I drifted off at some points. Um, but uh, I, I will be very interested to to like um, read it after again, and mm. like um, it's really nice uh, what um, like the topic of of this uh, lecture of this con conversation. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you for that. Yes, I did throw a lot at you. Um, you're very bright people. I know you can take it. And I also know that with, and that's why I put some effort into the slides, that you'll be able to go back and reflect on these and you'll be able to uh, look at it in your own context. And I would invite all of you to do that if you have time, um, wherever you are in the organization, at whatever level of challenge, whatever stage of a new activity or continuing activity you're in, um, to go back and perhaps use some of these tools um, and um, invite some trusted friends or colleagues to, to help you in that reflective process. And that actually fits very well with what Alexandra was saying, is how LEAP operates. We have periods of doing things, periods of learning, periods of trying things out, and periods of reflecting so that we can actually learn from our experiences rather than rushing past and sort of and, um, missing those opportunities to learn. So. Um, uh, um, that's what it's there for. Great. Thanks for making this amazing connection, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the new program. Um, do we have any more questions for Mark? It's your opportunity now to ask him. And while you're thinking about that, I'm also going to ask you to think about one more thing. Because uh, I've been going for, what, 45, um, uh, about 50 minutes. Uh, so, um, and I know that we've, we've just passed the, well, we've passed the hour now. Um, but if you would like to stay on for another 10 minutes, I've got a little story to tell, which I hope would be of interest. But I know Benoit and Tiffane have already heard it, so I will not in any way be upset if they decide to leave at this point. Um, so um, uh, please ask any more questions now, um, but also let me know whether um, you would, would, you're willing to stick around for another 10 minutes. Um, I have another question. Um, so based on my ICAS experience, um, what I personally experienced and what the president after me uh, also experienced is that um, when you are local president or responsible for a team, a project or something else, uh, there tend to be this tendency of the leader to take, to feel responsible for everything. And this uh, leads to the decrease of responsibility from the members mm. themselves. Mm. Um, and it's very difficult to uh, keep it aligned, this responsibility. How do you responsibilize your member through time? Mm. Uh, doing it one shot is really easy, but um, would you have some insight on Okay, how do you keep like the ladder quite quite same level and not starting to you know doing more and more because you want to go fast? Um, um, yeah. yeah, really good points, uh, Benoit, and and I know you and some of the other um, EB members have heard me bang on about how important it is for Oikos, particularly with the diverse structure of 50 chapters or so all around the world and with a remote uh, uh, executive uh, board, um, um, how do we make sure that there's an integral effort and people don't think, oh, it's all Oikos International that does everything. Um, and and, and um, it's by setting an example and setting expectations on people within your team at whatever level you are, that the, the leader is there ultimately to take responsibility, but they're not there to do it all. Absolutely not. That's what teams are for. And that you need to set some big rules and some little rules around how uh, work is, is, um, is carried out and how you maintain the culture of that dispersed individual and responsible leadership. 
And I do have an example, a sailing example, which might draw some of this stuff out. And you might remember, Benoit, that we used this when we were in Zurich. Um, and um, if you can bear it again, um, it might, you, you might get a, you, it might refresh some things. Thank you. So hands up, uh, or however you want to do it. Um, are people willing to stick around just for another 10 minutes before Alexandra uh, signs off uh, and tells you about dates and some process for LEAP? Oh, the hands are going up, certainly. Um, process for you. Yeah, quite enough. Uh, there's a few there. And anybody who wants to drop out, absolutely fine. It's been a privilege having you with us um, uh, uh, tonight, and uh, you will get the slides. So. Coming back to uh, Benoit's point, um, let, um, let me share a story now. If you just go to the last slide, I think it is, or the penultimate slide, please. You got that, Alexandra? Uh, one more. One more. You see that it's not the role of the leader, to, not just the role of the leader to take responsibility. There you are speaking to Ben's point. Um, now, um, uh, so individual and collective responsibility. Members of high performing teams show individual and collective responsibility for each other in achieving the vision and mission or the journey that you're on and in holding the values of the organization. And unless we instill a culture of that, it's not going to happen. And it's not just the role of the leader to take that responsibility. And if you go to the next slide, please. And I promise you, um, no more slides. You're just going to hear a story now. And um, uh, what I'd like um, uh, to do is to um, just tell you a story. And in some ways, this is an exercise in listening and reflecting and formulating formulating ideas for your own use in Oikos and or in your careers about how you engender individual and collective responsibility. And I'm going to use my, a personal story here, there are no more slides. And I had a wonderful opportunity um, about 10 years ago or so to take a gap year with my son. And we'd, I'd always had this ridiculous notion of wanting to sail the Atlantic from the UK to go to the Caribbean and, and come back again. And of course, that's a major undertaking. And so I'm going to use my experiences as the skipper or the leader of, of how we went about this project, which um, was um, uh, uh, involved um, sailing from the UK to the Caribbean and back. And this was 17,000 kilometers of open water sailing, uh, calling in at 14 islands and 11 countries, and it was a year away. So this was a big experience. It was not something that you undertake lightly. And while you listen to this story, I'd like you to not focus on the personalities, but just to think about what did the leader do right and wrong? What did the team members do right um, uh, uh, as well? And in fact, if I have time, I'll tell you about some of the things they did wrong. And what are the learnings for you in this story? which might answer Benoit's point. And just not uh, jot some of those ideas down so that you might be able to um, uh, uh, remember them. So obviously this was a big project. And the first thing to do is to get into project planning and uh, think about resources, finance, the equipment we were going to use and all the rest of it. And of course that included um, buying a yacht basically that would, which would be able to do this journey. And then the next great thing, which is more about the team, is the choice of the crew and how do you go about team building understanding the competencies fears hopes and expectations of the people that were going to go on this journey and the crews changed i should say we had a core group of people but we had actually 27 different people come out and join across at different times of uh, of the voyage some um, the tougher guys and gals for the ocean voyages and uh, some people just for a holiday quite frankly in the Caribbean um, but it was still sailing and then what about um, skills development so we had to think about um, understanding weather systems forecasting sea survival 
long-range radio and satellite communications, advanced medical care at sea, man overboard drills, and things like that. So all these were the new skills and competencies that we either took to a higher level or refreshed. I should say all of us had been sailors to a certain degree before, but we'd never aspired to anything this audacious before. Um, and then stakeholder engagement. See some of these words coming back again. Not just with the crew, but what about the families of the crew and friends and colleagues? And what were about the hopes and fears and needs and expectations of that wider stakeholder group? Because after all, their loved ones were going off into the deep blue, uh, into a very challenging environment indeed, with some genuine risk. So stepping outside and engaging with them in a more holistic way than just thinking about ourselves as the team, as the crew. And also, seeking expertise from outside of ourselves through professional organizations for professional advice and services and talking to people who've done it all, all before um, to give us some guidance. And then a lot, and I mean a lot, I did a lot of this, I come from Shell, so a lot of scenario planning to explore the what ifs. So what were all the things that could go wrong and to find contingencies and backup plans and backup equipment for all the things that could go wrong. And an awful lot can go wrong at sea. Um, a, a week on a boat at sea is like a, a week of strain on a boat, um, in a, a year, I should say, of, of, of strain on a boat um, that, that, that just is offshore sailing and sits in the marina for most of the year. So it, you're putting it through years of equivalent stress and strain and things break and, and go down and, and, and you have problems. So we had backups for everything, for radio and for satellite phone communications, navigational aids, spare parts, water maker, extra water tanks, diesel tanks, bottled water, fresh food, frozen food, dry rations in case everything else went wrong, emergency equipment like life rafts and para anchors and grab bags for if you were sinking. And so all of the sort of physical things like that. But we also set shared vision as a team on what the mission and the values were. And we all agreed this, that we, we all wanted to come back safe, happy and fulfilled at whatever level of challenge we'd set ourselves, whether it was ocean sailing or whether it was just having a bit of offshore fun in a Caribbean island. And to do that, we set big rules and little rules. And this speaks to Benoit's point. And the whole team, and indeed external stakeholders, had input into what these big and little rules were. And I want to share those um, with you. And we all agreed to hold one another individually and collectively responsible for upholding these rules um, and uh, throughout the whole year. And so some of the little rules were, if you're in your own cabin off watch, then that was your time and space. You, you didn't have to be bothered. You, you, you didn't have to engage or with anybody. You didn't have to explain why you wanted to be in your room. It was your space. And that was very important psychologically. But some of the big rules, no one ever comes up on deck without a life belt, without a life belt on and a harness clipped on or connected to the boat. You never come out of the cockpit, you know, the saloon, sorry, um, uh, it, I should have said in the saloon, you'd never come on deck without having a life belt on and you're clipped to the boat. And no one ever leaves the cockpit, that's the bit where the steering wheel is, and you can spend your outdoor time. Nobody comes, leaves that cockpit at night without being watched by at least one other crew member, because it's so easy for somebody to slip in or get into difficulties at night and the other people are off watch, they're sleeping. And that we would always keep a full watch at all times, in all weathers, day and night. And those were the big rules. And these rules were never broken because of the vigilance and the individual responsibility of everybody. So if somebody looked like breaking a rule, for example, by coming out up for a breath of air from the saloon and neglecting to clip on, others would immediately remind them of their responsibility to the safety of themselves and for others in doing so. Now, why? Because if anybody fell in 2,000 kilometers away from land in 10 meter seas, just looking for them would endanger the whole boat and the whole crew. 
So that's where the individual and collective responsibility comes in for, um, uh, for yourself and for thinking about the whole crew. And so it, nobody ever did. Nobody actually got into the cockpit without clipping on because people would automatically say, hey, oh, please clip on. Or where's your life jacket? Or go back down and get it. And that's what I mean about teams constantly reinforcing good behaviors and having the empowerment to do so um, in the moment when things need challenging. Um, and um, so all of these rules proved invaluable at some stage during that year. And another thing that we did, and I was very strong on, was that communications, and that every day we met, in inverted commas, morning and evening to share our feelings. So important to see how people are. Are they tired? Are they exhausted? Are they worried? Are they ill? Are they hurt? Uh, do they need a break, uh, a rest? And then also to check on the location, the weather, and to plan for the day or night and how we would act in the event of certain eventualities. So then we were all empowered to carry out our roles within these agreements. And that meant that as the skipper, for example, I could rest at night without being disturbed because if the wind got up and the sails had to be reefed or the boat tacked, people were entrusted to do those tasks without me being there. So this is where the leader was handing over the entire management of the boat and the responsibility for everybody to the person who was on watch. So again, this speaks to Benoit's point. And they only needed to resort to the leader if circumstances changed dramatically outside of the expectations that we'd set for that day or for that night, which they did sometimes. And people knew that it was okay to wake me up or to confer. And um, the same thing went for me. I wouldn't wake people up unnecessarily when I was on watch and something changed um, unless I really had to because there are only so many reserves of mental and physical energy in each of us and they have to be conserved like water in a desert when you're on a small boat in the middle of the uh, North Atlantic. So the planning, the empowerment and the upholding of the rules served us very well and it was almost an anticlimax when we completed all legs of the voyage without serious incident. And this was quite at odds with us as sailing and doing the same sort of circuit that we were. You know, we then heard about when we got back that there were demastings, lost rudders, men overboard, skippers cracking up under the strain, collisions with whales and half sunk containers and boats having to be abandoned at sea. And this is all for real. And it was only then that we realized how well our preparations and the culture and that sense of collective and individual responsibility had served us because we did the job without drama and terrible risk and consequences that were suffered by others. And we did achieve all of those things we set out to do, that we arrived happy, safe, and fulfilled. And there's one codicil to this story, which is where the leader here, me, was held to account. And I'm going to finish on this, because you've been very patient. And this is where the crew held me to account when I risked not upholding the values that we had agreed and we had set. So I'm being very honest about this. And this came about on the approach to after when we were uh, after we had done a night approach from the Azores to Bermuda. And, and we'd suffered two gales and a flat calm in the middle of the Atlantic uh, um, in the previous two weeks up to that point. And then as we approached the island of Horta, we under we were overtaken by a category one hurricane conditions, and I'm not exaggerating, with mountainous waves and a night approach on the island. And now we made it in and we used all of our reserves and energy, expertise and teamwork to sort of overcome that challenge. And at one point we even had all the emergency survival kit ready to go and to deploy if we didn't actually make it, but we did. And then the next day, I examined the engine and found it had lost some oil. It wasn't too surprising since it had been working hard to su supplement the, the sails as we were coming in. And I had an engineer look at it and he said he thought it was okay. And in any event, it would take two weeks to get the spare parts to fix it. Now, this is where 
I made a mistake because I knew that the crew were anxious to get home on the last leg. We're only about a week away from the UK in good weather. And in a moment of weakness, no, no doubt caused by the exhaustion of the, of the recent experiences, I suggested that we took the boat out on an engine test locally to see how it was. And if it was no worse, we would head off home. And then that's when the crew came to me and they said that they appreciated my concern that they wanted to get back quickly, but they didn't want me to waver from the safety first belt and braces approach and the values and operating principles that we'd set for the whole, for the whole voyage, that we wouldn't take unnecessary risks. And one that had seen us safely through all that appalling weather. So here, it was the crew that showed individual and collective responsibility in holding me to account as the leader to uphold our team values in my moment of weakness. And we ordered the spare parts and eventually we got them and we fitted them and we sailed home on the last leg without incident and the engine was absolutely fine. But the sort of moral of this story is that the culture of individual respect and collective responsibility had worked for all of us. The mo and that it's also the message that leaders need help from time to time. They're not perfect. They cannot be all the time. And you can get tired, you can get demoralized, you can get overwhelmed by events and circumstances. And that's when in the best high performing teams, you look for your team members to help the leader out and to remind them of what it is that we've all agreed um, and to provide that feedback selfishly, unselfishly, I should say, and constructively. So thank you very much for listening to this story. Um, and I hope it hasn't been too long. And, but I do hope that some of what we've covered in the story and what we've done in the webinar today will be of value to you in your Oikos roles and uh, further along in, in, in your future careers. So thank you very much for listening and for being so patient. And I hand you back over now to Alexandra. Thank you so much, Mark, for this very, very interesting analogy. It was very inspiring. And for this uh, interesting webinar with um, so many inspiring and help, like uh, topics that will help us and um, methods that can help us. Just um, some few things that I keep, will keep in mind is that uh, what competences that leaders need um, should be more people related also this, these days. Um, for example, we need to be more people smart, we need to be more self-aware, we need higher learners, we need a uh, collaborative mind and uh, cross-cultural intelligence. And um, I just wanted, want to remind you that all, like, a lot of those topics we touch base in, in the leap and a lot of those things you can actually learn in the leap, like self-awareness or self-confidence, like, like Mark also said, is one, one very important thing. Or cross-cultural, we have so many different cultures here that we all work together and we're collaborative. Um, everything that we do is collaborative. The whole approach we learn from each other, everybody from, from each one of us, uh, from each one of you. Um, and it's all about learning and keeping the learning uh, um, in your whole life and how can you constantly develop yourself and drive yourself out of your comfort zone sometimes even. Mm. Um, another thing that is very important for a leader today is to have an external mindset um, to empower and to also to empower others to develop their external mindset. And uh, there was some very interesting questions on how can I do that? And Mark said, it's a lot about coaching. It's a lot about coaching those people to, um, and empowering them um, to develop themselves. And that is also a thing that you can learn in LEAP. And that's especially for the LEAPers that are doing the LEAP Advanced now. Um, if you want to become a coach, it's possible to join the LEAP for the next year and then um, also improve your coaching skills. Um, and Mark also emphasized on culture and uh, the importance of establishing this culture in this very, very early stage of a team. 
And um, I also want to remind you that we have we had a web uh, we had a web uh, sorry we had a webinar on culture, and it was also an open webinar, and you can rewatch this webinar also on our YouTube channel. Um, it's Oikos International on YouTube um, for everybody. It's and it's it, it's in the leap um, the leap playlist, so you can find it there. And yeah, it. Uh, culture is very important and as Mike, uh, Mark, sorry, Mark said, it's individual and culture uh, and collective responsibility that we have to establish at a very early stage. So the leaders, we as a leader are not responsible for everything ourselves, but the team will take care of the things then also if in case we need it. Thanks again, Mark, for this very, very uh, great webinar. Um, I will share the presentation with the participants and uh, I, I will share also the link and since it's an open webinar it will also be available for everybody to see on our uh, YouTube channel um, so you can send it to your members also so they can have a look at it, it, it as well and um, yeah I would like to have a round of applause from for Mark Thanks a lot for joining us today and uh, we're happy to have you on the team. Always. And a great summary, uh, Alexandra, as well. Terrific summary and um, a great advert for LEAP. And I would only join you uh, in encouraging people to get as much out of LEAP as they possibly can. It's the most marvelous program. And Alexandra and Adriana do a brilliant job with all their supporters and helpers um, to really growing leaders of beyond the norm, which I know is what you all aspire to. So um, I wish you every success and you're not alone. Anybody, um, you, anybody who knows me already will know that you only have to drop me an email. Ava, I can see you smiling. Um, uh, Clementine, uh, Alexandra, just drop me an email um, and, um, uh, or phone me up. Uh, I, I'm there for you, I promise. Okay, so can I share the email address with Please do, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Great. I will do so. Yeah. Thanks a lot again, Mark. Yeah. Bye bye yeah. then. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a good evening. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. And for the others, um, I would like to, to make some announcements for the leap. And uh, then we have some time to, to discuss if you would like to stay. We can discuss the topic or whatever you prefer to do. Um, but for now, I just quickly share my screen again. Um, okay, so um, some leap dates for the leap advanced cohort. Um, the next webinar we fixed it today. Adriana fixed it today with Dan Newby, and it will be on emotions because we've seen that during the midterm meeting that's a very important topic and it's an emotional topic. So um, we thought it would be really interesting to have a, have a webinar on that, and it will be on the twenty eighth of May at 6.30 p.m. Central Eastern European time again. Um, so already mark this on your, in your calendar. Uh, I will also send an email out. And for those that are interested to join the lead now, we will have an informational call on Monday the 24th of June at 7 p.m. Um, Central Eastern European time. You can come there to get to know the program a little bit better to ask all the questions that you have. We will, um, we will try to answer all of them. Um, we will give you some inputs. There will be some leapers also that can share some experiences. And yeah, it will be a nice call about the program before the, the vacation starts. And then the applications for the next cohort are open from 1st of July on. So start spreading the words in your chapters for those that are interested. Um, they can apply from beginning uh, 1st of July. Great. So do you have any questions on that?